Let's see, something festive to talk about. How about dictionaries? How many of you like dictionaries? Are they modern and cool? How long have they been around? Hash tables. How long is forever? Over 30 years. The art of uh, computer programming, Donald Knuth, Algorithm D, it's been in Python for 26 years. Is there anything new? No? Nothing's changed? How many of you uh, learned hash tables a long time ago? How many of you think you still have something to learn? Who thinks you know it all already? <laughs> How many of you learned everything there was to know about hash tables before last year? That's good because you'd be out of date. There are new things under the sun. They've gotten better and better. On the other hand, one of the interesting themes of the talk is we're going to uh, take a journey there and back again. And the there starts, what did we have before we had hash tables? We had databases. We had Lisp. We had ancient tech. We're never going back there again, are we? <laughs> How many of you are going to do uh, Lisp association tables instead of Python dictionaries? How many of you would rather use a database than a Python dictionary? That's too bad. That's where our journey is going to end up. All right. So uh, let's see. Hosted by Microsoft Reactor. Thank you very much, Microsoft. It is wonderful to donate this space and this time. I've always been a fan of Microsoft, but now I'm a huge fan. What they have done for our community has uh, just been spectacular. Thank uh, Grace and Simeon, conference uh, organizers, and thank you, Ben. Uh, me, my mission is to train thousands of Python programmers, not, uh, not figuratively, but literally. I've uh, just crossed the 5,000 number that I've trained personally, and then my team uh, has cumulatively trained over 10,000 Python programmers. And we're not talking about an hour or two training, we're talking week-long uh, uh, training sessions and it is a language that sells itself. If I do anything cool up here, uh, tweet about it uh, with Raymond H. If you uh, don't do anything cool or say something weird, misspell one of these letters. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. So uh, I don't do slides, I do Sphinx. I will post the slides, I mean the website for this uh, right afterwards and tweet it out for those of you who are interested. And our journey, the beginning and the end. So I'll start with the punchline. When you tell a joke, you shouldn't start with the punchline, but I thought you should just see where we're going. So what's Python got? Python's got dictionaries, lots of dictionaries. The entire language is uh, uh, wrapped around them. Various namespaces, globals is a dictionary. Locals isn't actually a dictionary unless you ask to see the locals, at which point it turns into a dictionary. Internally, it's in a, uh, implemented in a more optimized form. But conceptually, it's a dictionary and behaves like a dictionary that you can't uh, write to. Modules are dictionaries. Classes are thin wrappers around uh, dictionaries. Instances are thin wrappers around dictionaries. Are there dictionaries everywhere? Everywhere. I see dictionaries everywhere. So they're kind of uh, important. All the code you see will be uh, code that runs under Python 2.7, runs under Python 2.6, 3.0, all the way up to, what's the latest version of Python you're using right now? Well, the one I'm gonna have up here will be uh, the 3.6, uh, but you're right, I run on uh, 3.7 every day, build a fresh one, and it runs under all of these. So, uh, I came up with a bogus uh, class, user property, that takes some values and assigns them to some famous people, uh, like uh, Quido, Barry Rorsall, my lovely wife, Tim <laughs> Peters, and Sarah, who sent me an email that I didn't get. <laughs> it has a clever wrapper so that we can see it. I make uh, three instances of it. One user property is colors, one's another cities, another is fruits. Blue goes up to uh, Quido, orange goes over to uh, Sarah, but in cities, Quido gets Austin and Sarah gets Dallas. You see how it rolls, right? So we've got a class, we've got three instances. A lot of people like to get to the dictionary for an instance by doing uh, dunder dict. There's a function for getting there. What's it called? Vars. How many of you knew Vars is there? Vars is an unloved function. You should start to love it. It's really kind of awesome uh, once you get used to it. But everyone forgets that it's there. And that will uh, uh, just simply print the uh, three instance dictionaries. And this part is, well, 
I'm the editor tools guy, so I'm very functional. I do a map of a of errors of a size of, of a map of a list of a print, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, makes me feel very functional and happy. So what do we get? We get three instance dictionaries. Guido's blue, Sarah's orange, Guido's Austin, Sarah's Dallas, Guido's Apple, Sarah is banana. All right, what is the uh, point of this? The point of this is this is a stand-in for basically every important Python program that runs on the face of the planet. Somewhere there's a class, lots of instances, and they have lots of dictionaries, suggesting that dictionaries are important to us. I'm going to pick uh, uh, these to talk about during the class. So let's jump right to the end, the punchline in Python 2.7. How big are each of these dictionaries? 280 bytes each. I know what you're thinking. That's huge. It's huge good when it comes to memory. No. no, huge is bad. I remember when I was little on a birthday party. This is about first grade. I and my friends got taken out to play miniature golf. One of my friends was so excited that he got the highest score. We didn't have the heart to tell him. So which is the highest scoring, best Python of all time that gets the highest score for dictionary skies? Python 2.7. Uh, by 3.5, it's been shrunk down to 196 bytes. Guess who was responsible for all of that savings? <laughs> I'm looking for a name. Starts with a Mark, ends with a Shannon. How many of you know Mark Shannon? So this is from Key Sharing Dictionary. So something kind of awesome happened uh, when Mark got to it. He realized that Quido has been repeated uh, three times. Is the world big enough for three Quidos? <laughs> I don't think so. So Mark got this bright idea. How about we store Quido once, his hash once, and then only save the data separately? So this was called a key sharing dictionary, and you've already got it in Python 3.5. Who thinks that's kind of cool? Mark is a smart man, which is why they gave him a PhD. Then Python uh, 3.6, they got a little smaller. How did that happen? We compacted them. And so I'd like to show you how compact dicks work how it is that this technology that's been known since 1970 has been refined in, uh, by a lot of people, how it ended up down here at less than half the size. By the way, how many of you think that's a pretty impressive uh, savings? And by the way, this is not a random obscure corner of Python. Dictionaries are everywhere. You're going to get a massive savings. Now, I'm a big fan of Python uh, 2.7. That said, in, uh, for the last seven years, I've devoted all of my evenings and weekends to making uh, Python 3 better. And so I would have loved to have come out and told you how awesome Python 3 was all the time, but I never did that until today. Python 3.6 comes out in a week. You really want it. It actually is the best Python ever. It's the first Python 3 worthy of the name. Go get it. <laughs> Beautiful is better than ugly. Is scrambled better than ordered? So in Python 2.7, we put in Quido first, but now Sarah moves to the uh, uh, top of the list and poor Quido is last, after Tim, Rachel, and Barry. Do you th Who's there? <laughs> that was uh, uh, quite interesting. So uh, <laughs> it's scrambled but deterministic. So on any Python 2.7, you will get exactly the same order, which is not the order that you put it in. At one time, there was almost articulated a principle that scrambled is better than ordered, but because, or since because these things had scrambled, people would learn how hash tables would work. And so whenever you taught somebody Python, one of the first things they would ask is, are the dictionaries, do they remember that the order that you put them in? And you would explain no and explain how the uh, hash tables work. It was such an easy explanation because what raised the question was that the uh, elements went in out of the order that they were put in. I know what you're uh, thinking. What if they accidentally showed up in alphabetical order? Would that mess up your, uh, uh, your explanation? You all don't know what to say. When I pound on the table, you're supposed to say there must be a better way. Ready? There must be a better way! There is a better way. Scrambled is better than ordered. And by Python uh, 3.5, we have the SIP hash. So the hashes get randomized every time you turn on Python. And so occasionally Sarah gets to go first and Tim goes second. But once in a while, uh, one time in five, Quido gets to go first. Every time you turn it on, it scrambles. So everyone's doc test who relied on the order, what happened to them? Broken. So scrambled was better than order. Better than just scrambled, it was randomized. I know what you're thinking. There must 
in Python 3. These are ordered. They go in in exactly the same order you put them in. Isn't that nice? <laughs> now, you don't like ordered then. All right, if you don't like ordered, then you're going to love what Quito said. Quito said, ordering is not guaranteed. You can't rely on it. Now, he'll change his mind a few years from now. But for now, if you actually want an ordered dictionary, you should input an uh, ordered dictionary. But I can assure you, I've been working with this for a while, and I really enjoy it. It's very, very nice. And a lot of people want a sorted dictionary, one that's sorted in a particular order. How do you make one of those? It's easy. Take your key, uh, items, sort it, and stick it in the dictionary, and the order is uh, uh, preserved. It's fantastic. And it's small. Small and ordered. Welcome to the third millennium. It's a great time to be alive. So I've t uh, started you at the end of the story where we're going to end up. Are you ready for the journey? All right, here we go. A journey with code. Lots of little tiny code. Would you like it to be bigger? Yes. There. It's one of my favorite keys on the Mac. Make big. It's the story of evolution. In the beginning, there were databases. Now. Oh, that says no, it is comfortable. It should say now. OK, so much for spell check. We'll just scroll that off the screen like it never happened. So here's our setup. I'm importing the future, got pprint, which is um, your best friend when you're dealing with nested data structures. I've recorded the keys, the values uh, for each of the dictionaries, all of the hashes uh, uh, for those, and uh, entries. An entry would be a tuple of length three, the hashes, a hash, the key, and the value. And a combined entry says, let's put the hash keys in all three values in the uh, uh, same list of tuples. So this is our input data. So the question is, how would a database have stored uh, our three instances? Welcome to 1960. In 1960, we had these cute little columns. Here was the uh, fruit column. Here was the uh, column for the city. Here was the color column. And this uh, used to be known by a fancy name. It was called the primary key kind of like a main squeeze, you know what I mean? What was, why would they have stored information uh, uh, this way? Because memory was precious, unlike now where it's just overflowing. No, it's not. Data got bigger, a lot bigger. So this is how we used to do it. We stored this in a flat file. Any ever you see a flat file like that? 1960s technology. Are you, let's go get rid of it. After all, they had no idea what they were doing back then, and they weren't very smart. <laughs> they, taught, uh, uh, they taught our parents, our parents taught us, and now we are the smartest generation of all. We come up with all the clever stuff, and our parents would be dazzled and amazed by what we've accomplished. You guys sound dubious. <laughs> and showmanship, that part's called the promise. Later, we will fulfill the promise. All right. So how would Lisp do it? Lisp would uh, store these as association list. It would associate a key with a value, just a, uh, a list of uh, uh, pairs. And Lisp got by very far with just association list. Okay. Now, how, what does that cost us in space? Up here in the flat file, Quito was mentioned once. Now he's mentioned three different times. After all, uh, by the time we got to uh, Lisp, we didn't care about memory anymore. Fair enough? All right. So while we're in the spirit of throwing away memory, let's see if we can make it bigger. After all, bigger is better. We want the highest score. Currently, who's the high score winner? The database or the association list? Association list is currently the high score winner. We can do better. So we decided to speed it up a little bit. The problem with what we were doing here is it had a linear search. If you're looking for poor Rachel, you had to go down four steps in order to find out that she has the pair and uh, she's associated with our Reno. Better way is separate chaining. We make a set of buckets, and then each bucket has a list, and we uh, grow the list. And now, uh, that's going to reduce the linear search by a constant factor. For instance, if I make two buckets, I've got one here, and in that bucket, we have both Quito and Tim, Sarah, Barry, and Rachel stand alone. What was fantastic about this is if you wanted to go look for Rachel, you computer hash, that's this number right here, modulo 4, drop in uh, to the uh, uh, fourth entry, and check out, and there's Rachel. 
Oh, actually, I said fourth. This one's separate chaining two. There's two buckets, one with two people in it, one with three people in it. So to look for Rachel, you compute her hash, and she says she's in the second bucket. Now you scan through and do a linear search. It takes three probes to find Rachel. Formerly, it took four. She's improved her uh, lot in life by 33%. No, was that 25%? All right. Nice speed improvement. Good job, Rachel. Quito gets found right away. Sarah gets found right away. Barry has to wait one step. Poor Rachel has to wait three. It is a better way. You can make more buckets. More buckets, I have four separate lists here. One list has Sarah and Barry in it, but Quito, Tim, and Rachel stand alone. So four people get found instantly. They each have one probe, and then Barry has two probes. What's the weighted average number of probes there? 1.2, a lot faster than to begin with. And how are we doing on memory? Well, not so well. We've now stored the hash value as well as the key uh, and the value. And in addition, each of these lists needs room to grow, so it over allocates. We've thrown more memory away. Who is our new high score for maximum memory used? Our new high score is separate chaining. High score is better, right? Okay. Remember, don't tell the person at the birthday party that if they get the highest number of points at miniature golf, that they're not the best. My friend said, I won. And we didn't have the heart to tell them. So we're not going to tell separate chaining. So now we can uh, go even further. Since we're wasting space, how can we make it worse? We'll go up to <laughs> eight buckets. Now with eight buckets, some of the buckets are empty, but there's no longer any collisions. Everybody gets found on one probe, and Rachel has improved her lot in life from four probes to one, a 300% improvement. That Rachel is pretty happy, don't you agree? What about our memory usage? Well, we have several lists that need room to grow. We've uh, stored the hash. Each one of these has over allocation. We have a new record for wasted memory space, but we've sped up our search uh, dramatically. Several hundred percent. There is another way. It's called open addressing. In open addressing, rather than having the extra space at the end of uh, each of these lists so that we can grow the list, the idea is we make one big table to begin with and then we insert everything into that one table. So this is going to make a table of size eight, loop over all the entries, compute the uh, index modulo the table size, and then this part is new logic. This part says if the table is already occupied, you have to find another slot. So I'll do open addressing uh, for eight probes, and you've got a table of size eight. This time, there is no over allocation at all. Congratulations, you saved some space. Did it cost you something? Poor Timmy. Timmy collided with Sarah. Timmy wanted to be in this slot. So we did a linear probe, and we wrapped him around. Easy enough, linear probes are easy to compute. It says take the next available slot. How bad could it be? We end up with what's known as catastrophic linear pileup. Once in a while, your application becomes dog slow because everybody wants the same or close to the same uh, address. I know what you're thinking. There is a better way. By the way, we've gotten you now up to Nuth Algorithm D. You're now up to 1972 technology. The concept of uh, multiple hashing was uh, known uh, even back then, and the idea is if the first hash has a collision, rather than do a linear probe, now do a secondary hash and find another uh, place. And the idea is you still have a collision, but you're not going to end up with a big 500 car pileup all in uh, uh, one place. In other words, it doesn't speed up the best case, it just keeps the worst case from being catastrophic. Fair enough? However, Uncle Timmy comes along. Tim Peters, the hero of this story, and Tim gets this bright idea. Tim ha says, we know all about random number generators, and a very simple one is a linear congruential random number generator. Take a number, multiply it by five, add one, and take it uh, a modulo, some uh, a fixed modulus. And if you recycle that over and over again, it gives you a uh, chain of our, our random numbers. In other words, it probes around randomly in a different pattern depending on uh, your full hash value. What's cool about this is uh, Tim found a way to perturb, shift in some additional bits, and when you're out of bits, 
this uh, random number sequence is guaranteed to, over time, visit every single separate uh, cell in your table. That way, if there's a hole in it, it's guaranteed to be found. This was kind, kind of important because if it didn't search all of the uh, places, at some point, it could get trapped in a loop, and your uh, dictionary would tie up your uh, system, put it in a deadlock, causing it to die just before your IPO during the due diligence check. Thank you, Timmy. So Timmy to, uh, put in something new under the sun, something that wasn't in algorithm D. Algorithm D had multiple hashing, but if the secondary hash didn't help you, it fell back to linear probes. Instead, he put in the random number generator, and suddenly, we no longer had catastrophic linear pileup. Thank you, Uncle Timmy. When did you get this? When did it go into Python? It was already there when I arrived in Python 1.5.2. Timmy goes way back. Now, uh, what does this structure uh, uh, look like? Ooh, I go ahead and build one of the five. Does, uh, did I end up with a few collisions? That Barry, he bumped into Quido. Quido uh, bumped into Rachel. Rachel bumped into Barry. Rachel bumped into Quido. And then Tim uh, bumped into uh, a Rachel. Is there a lot of bumping going on? So five collisions in this tiny little uh, uh, table. We've actually slowed it down a little bit over what we had before. So what did we gain? We saved some space. That's really nice. And more importantly, we saved our worst case because our worst case, uh, without the randomization, is that it was going to tie up and sit there and probe back and forth between two slots, never find an open slot, and die on you. Thank you, Uncle Timmy, for slowing down, no, uh, saving space and preventing uh, disaster. How long did this technology last? This went for uh, quite a while, but when I was uh, on the scene very early on, probably in my first three or four years of uh, contribution, my contribution was to take a look, uh, analyze the performance of these dictionaries, and I realized, you know, we're still getting a lot of collisions. Maybe we should make the table more sparse. So if you were using Python 2.7 or before, what uh, the dictionaries would do when they resize is they wouldn't double when they needed more space. They would quadruple. So it meant most dictionaries, most of the time, had enough space in it to where you had hardly any collisions. All I did was throw away some space, but I topped out at about 50,000 entries. Above 50,000 entries, we go back to doubling once it got up to a size that you would actually notice. So when you're not looking for all the little small nickel and dimes, I was quadrupling your space. But if you quadruple a tiny dictionary, that's not a lot. Then Mark Shannon came along and said, this is terrible, and he turned it back to doubling. So you got that about uh, Python uh, 3.2. He slowed down the Python a little bit, but saved a little space in little no, uh, nooks and crannies. Do you see a little tug of war but strain, uh, strengths and weaknesses? Didn't I mention Mark Shannon is brilliant? He came up with uh, something cool. Now I'm about to alter time, you know, like in Star Trek Voyager, you know. Captain, we've encountered a temporal anomaly. The temporal anomaly is this. The compact dick just happened. I thought of it four years ago, proposed it four years ago, and Quido wasn't in an accepting mood at that point. All you have to do with him is be patient. And eventually he goes, oh, great idea. Sure, put it right on in. Pi Pi, uh, in the meantime, uh, was more aggressive and put it in a couple of years ago. And so uh, those of you who are Pi Pi users have been having the compact dick. But prior to that was key sharing dick. So the Tim Twirl anomaly is I'll show you compact dick first. Why? It's cleaner to show it to you uh, this way. So compact dict looks very much like the other dict, except that I pull all of the indices out, and the hash table is now, this is an array of bytes. So each, this is one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte. We don't really use ones uh, or nones. We use a uh, negative one. So the hash table part of this is tiny. Now notice up here, this is stored dense. There's no spa open spaces in it. Plus, it got stored in the order listed. So every time you add a key, well, the first key added was Quido and Blue and his hash code. And that's appended right to the beginning of the structure. And then you add in Sarah. It goes in right next. No wasted space at all. So the problem with the structure up here is it was wide and it has holes in it. The holes aren't so bad unless it's wide. But now each hole gets multiplied by the width. Do you see the problem? My bright idea was smush all of these together and put the holes in a tiny little table. So your hash is eight bytes, 
This pointer is 8 bytes. This pointer is 8 bytes. They're 24 each. 24 uh, times 5, what, 120, somewhere thereabouts? So 120 bytes for that. Down here, though, the part is, is the actual index is into the hash table. The first hash code is 0. Remember, Aquito uh, was in position 5 before? So position 5 refers to 0. Sarah's referred to by this one. The number 2 refers to Barry. And so I have indexes uh, reaching into this, which raises the question, how big is this thing? It is 8 bytes total. So all of uh, this was 120 bytes. The hash table part of this is only 8. Who thinks that's kind of cool? Hash tables used to waste space like crazy. Now, for a dictionary of this size, the hashing part takes only 8 bytes. How big is a hash line on a, uh, a cache line on a computer, one of your machines? Not a single person in the room knows how big a, uh, a cache line is on your machines. How many bits did you buy at the big store? 16, 32, 8, 64? You've got a 64-bit machine. It's the size of a cache line. So when we fetch one byte from memory, you actually get 64 back. Are you trying to tell me that if you uh, go to look up this uh, hash table and load it into memory, it takes exactly one memory fetch? What if this dictionary is bigger? This, what if this dictionary holds 128 entries? How big is this thing? One byte each, one times 128. What did you guys drink? <laughs> I don't want that. OK, so 128 bytes. What's 128 divided by 64? Two. Two. Two memory fetches to pull in the entire hash table for a uh, di dictionary of 128 entries. Pretty awesome. How long do each of the uh, fetches take? You hear that they take three cycles. Uh, that's the latency. But the throughput is one cycle, which means you issue one fetch, and then you uh, fetch the other one, so it takes uh, one cycle later. So it takes a total of four clock cycles to pull in this entire table. Who thinks that's kind of awesome? Yeah. And if you compared it to what we had before, this thing was huge. Remember, the smallest dictionary was 280 bytes, not things like eight. So that was uh, my contribution. I proposed it uh, about four years ago. I brought it to uh, Python Dev. And some people, yeah, this kind of nice. Oh, it seems good. Mark Chen is like, you go back to the drawing board. You study more. And when one of the smartest people on the planet tells you to go back to the drawing board, you know it's all over. And Quido expressed no excitement whatsoever. What should you do? Crawl into your cave and admit defeat or take a back door? Back door. Is there more than one Python implementation? Yeah. Python written in Py Python. PyPy. So I get on IRC. I uh, find uh, Machek and uh, Armin, and I said, I've got this great recipe, a proof of concept. I've already written all the code for a compact dict in pure Python, and have already tested it in PyPy, and see that in PyPy, it saves memory and runs faster. So this pure Python code run through PyPy gave you the uh, uh, compact dict right away. So they went and studied it and said, this seems like a reasonably good idea, and they did something that felt really good. Do you remember when uh, Tim invented his own uh, sort routine? What did he call it? Tim sort. sort. And then I put so much effort into uh, designing this thing. Do you know what it was called? The Raymond Dict. <laughs> they referred to it in all of their documents as Raymond Dict. Uh, they sent me notes about the Raymond Dict. We discussed the uh, Raymond Dict. And then Machek found that many, many years ago, somebody had worked out something like this in Java. So. It no longer got called the Raymond Dick. It got idea proposed by Raymond with uh, significant prior work in Java. Not a Raymond Dick anymore. <laughs> Java Dick. That's OK. We're going back in time to Java. <coughs> this is the part of the journey where we stop going forward. We start going backward. <laughs> backward for two reasons. One is I presented this out of, <coughs> out of order. In fact, prior to the compact dict was the key sharing dict. I already discussed the concept of key sharing. Instead of putting Quido in three times for each instance, how about we store his key one time, the hash one time, and only save the values? This is wonderful. It means every time you have an instance, all it's storing in the instances are just the values and not the keys. Who thinks that's pretty awesome? That Mark Shannon, one smart dude. Now, finally, we come to 
Mark Shannon's got a, uh, a key sharing dict, and I've got a compact dict, and somebody is going to win. Who got there first? Well, in my story, I get here first. But in reality, who got there first? Mark. So Mark's going to be there first, and my comeback dick's going to be squeezed out, never to see the light of day. Unless it was a romance. Unless they were destined to meet. Maybe they were meant for each other. Maybe they were perfect compliments. Maybe they were two great ideas, individually conceived, that came together and made something wonderful. Like chocolate and peanut butter, Reese's, Kit Kat bars. I like the way you're thinking. Five bucks. I don't actually pay up. I just like saying it. All right. So uh, I won't even show you key sharing directly. I'll just show you shared and compact. We make a uh, nice little table. We loop over the position and uh, entries. We still have Tim Peters' randomization uh, uh, logic. We still check to see if the table's not none. But what we insert into the table is uh, just the position. And then we uh, uh, append the entry. And here's what it looks like. Now we have Quido, Blue, Austin, and Apple, all of these in one table. Notice Quido is only mentioned one time. Notice uh, each of these fields have one time. Notice there's no space in between them. The only thing that indexes them is this little table. How many bytes wide is this? I'm looking for some number that is eight times one. I know the drinks have hit hard. This thing is only eight bytes to index this table. Now, what if I, ooh, I didn't change the number here. That one should be 16. Interestingly, I can make the table more sparse, reduce collisions, and speed it up. Remember, the last time we tried to uh, increase sparseness, it slowed down, uh, or it, uh, we de decreased uh, sparseness, it ate up uh, memory but it sped up the program. Remember when we went from quadrupling back to doubling? All because we were afraid of wasting space. Are you still afraid of doubling the size of your dictionary or quadrupling it? You should no longer be afraid. Let's change it from size eight to 16. When we do, is there any change in the table of keys and hashes and values? No change at all. What changes? This part uh, down here. I'm looking for a size here, some number that is about 16 times 1. <laughs> to uh, double the size of this table cost 8 bytes. This whole thing is still fetched in a uh, single uh, cache line fetch. Who thinks that's awesome? We can now make uh, the dictionaries much more sparse, to where um, uh, arbitrarily sparse to eliminate collisions without throwing away any memory. Who learned something new? Of course you learn something new. This is all brand new. You don't get it until you get Python 3.6. It comes out in a week. Get it now. It's worth it. It's awesome. How many of you think I'm really darn clever coming up with the uh, compact dict? <laughs> How many of you think that Mark Shannon was really, really awesome when he came up with key sharing so that we didn't have multiple uh, uh, quidos? And this is the state of the art of the technology in uh, 2017, modulo and extra thing put in by Victor Stinner that I will mention uh, shortly. And now we've progressed so far. And I bet if I show this to my father, he's going to go, wow, you youngsters are so smart. I'm really glad we taught you how to program. If my grandfather were alive, I could go show him this. And he said, wow, my grandson invented a compact dict, got together with a key sharing, and invented something that these kids are so smart. I've got a question for you. Have you ever seen this before, this table? Not this part. Have you ever seen this? We've just reinvented the technology of 1960. It is exactly this, but augmented by a hash and augmented by a byte size uh, uh, index table. It turns out, our fathers and grandfathers, our mothers and grandmothers knew this a long time ago. And they're just like, you kids, you had all this space to waste. You used it all up. And you, suddenly your megabytes grew into uh, gigabytes and your gigabytes grew into terabytes. And you had all this space and you just wasted it. And then suddenly your data turned into petabytes. And now you care once again. <laughs> all right. So, oh. Uh, I'd like to think that we're all just uh, really clever, but in fact, this is the technology of yesteryear, and what hasn't happened uh, before is someone uh, never came along and said, 
What we knew about databases a long, long time ago could be applied now to object-oriented uh, world where you have uh, many instances. Now imagine I get 100 instances. All this thing is going to do is grow out to the right. The table, the uh, index table itself isn't going to change. So if you have 10,000 instances, this grows to the right, this thing stays the same width and it still has the same lookup speed. And at this size, each person has exactly one probe, no hash collision. Imagine 10,000 instances, no redundancy, fully as dense as a uh, database, and the lookup table into it that makes it fast loads in a single cache line with zero collisions. Welcome to 2016. What are you going to uh, download come Tuesday of next week? Starts with a pi and ends with a 3.6. Uh, uh, the last page here is uh, my original recipe for the compact dick that I presented uh, four years ago. It went into PyPy uh, two years ago. It went into uh, CPython, uh, I think, two or three months ago at our Facebook uh, uh, sprints. Uh, it is not perfect inside. The implementation has not fully realized some of the benefits in here. It's got the space savings. Some of the benefits that have yet to be uh, realized is this part. The resize is kind of awesome. Currently, the resize logic in Python 3.6 builds a brand new table by reinserting when it gets larger. But as you saw before, really all that has to change is the index table and we don't have to uh, move the entries. I timed uh, resizing many years ago and I was shocked to find out something. You uh, have a table this big and you want to make a new table this big. You allocate the new table and then you start inserting the entries one at a time into the new table to make it more sparse. Which part takes more time, making the table or inserting the entries? I would have guessed inserting the entries, but the new table is twice as big as the old one. It only takes one memory allocation, but then you have to do a mem set to zero it out. And shockingly, when you time it, zeroing the memory took more time than the actual insertions. Who learned? Something new. After all, you're not inserting into every element. You're just taking a table that's only two-thirds full. So you've got a table of size 16. Two-thirds full is 10 entries. is now going into a table of 32. You're only hitting one-third of the rows. Actually making the zeros cost all the time. So when this next fix gets uh, put in, hopefully in some point in 3.7, what it's going to mean is that the cost of resizing is we're not going to have to move almost any of that data. The only thing that needs to be zeroed is that little byte index table, which can be done in a couple of uh, uh, clock cycles. In other words, resizing will become basically free. One other uh, uh, benefit that's uh, kind of cool is, do you see this thing here that says iter? What does it iterate over? Iterates over the key list. And formally, uh, on a dictionary of uh, size 16, the key uh, is two-thirds full. We loop over it, and some of the uh, entries are empty. So we have to loop 16 times, and we have an unpredictable branch. Is this table got a key, or is it empty? Cable or empty. But now, all of those keys are all pushed to the left side. They're all dense, so all 10 entries are in order. When we finish up improving this one, you'll be able to iterate over a dictionary as fast as a list. Why? Because it is a list inside. It's all consecutive uh, uh, pointers. Not a single branch from its prediction, not a single wasted space. So if the table's of size 16, you only have to loop over 10 consecutive entries. Who learned something new? Other uh, uh, cool tech is the uh, uh, size of uh, the table. It auto resizes. If your table is size 128 or less, it uses a byte array. However, if it's a little bit bigger, it goes to a word size array, so 16 bytes. And then if it gets even bigger, it starts to use a long. And then finally, last, it only uses big pointers. In other words, the table automatically scales the size density of the indices based on how big your table is. Most dictionaries, most of the time, are really small, so they're one byte each. And that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Oh. <laughs> one other righteous dude needs to be uh, um, uh, mentioned, Victor Stinner. Victor Stinner uh, came up with a, a fairly neat idea. 
A lot of times, when we're looping through our programs, we get an attribute, we go look it up, and there's a dictionary lookup to go find that attribute. And possibly, there's a chain of lookups when you have an inheritance uh, a hierarchy. What if we were to mark each of these uh, dictionaries with a dirty bit to indicate when it was uh, changed? Now, all of the internal routines that access these dictionaries, when they go to look up an attribute, they can check and say, have I looked up this attribute before? If I have, it'll check the dirty bit. If it's not dirty, if the dictionary hasn't changed, and it almost never changes, it doesn't have to do the lookup again. In other words, Dick, uh, Victor has found a way to, not only have we sound sa uh, found a way to save space, but we can actually eliminate a lot of the lookups altogether. That is in Python 3.6 as well. And so uh, I like to uh, come up with a name for this for uh, PyCon. I didn't title it this here. But essentially, the modern dictionaries are a confluence of about a dozen different ideas from different people over time. And individually, they were nothing. Collectively, they've made the force awesome to behold. And we've rediscovered the technology of 1960. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you at the holiday party. Mr. Spock, do you want the con, or should we take questions? Take some, take some questions, and I have one. Do you have any, do you have any benchmarks? So smaller memory size, do you have any benchmarks? Does that affect the speed of real-world programs? What's the actual memory I don't, but Victor does, and he published them, and they were not huge. Uh, remember, the algorithms are exactly the same as what we had before, and there's an extra indirection step. The worry was it was going to make Python slower because we had to go through the uh, indirection uh, table, but then it was uh, realized that that table can be read in a single uh, cache line, or two consecutive uh, 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 lines in, and that we actually got a net benefit from fewer uh, memory accesses and better uh, cache performance. But since the algorithms uh, were the same, it was mostly about uh, space savings. That said, when you make something smaller, your cache performance uh, improves, and you automatically get some win. So I believe it's a few percent in terms of uh, speed, but mostly it's about space. And it'll really pay off when you get hit with the big data. You'll find the big data, the size of the data, is the size of how much space it actually takes. David, what you got? What happens if you, what happens if you delete uh, an entry in your dictionary and add another entry? Does your, do you lose your order? I, don't, I never delete. <laughs> so this is a good question. What happens when you delete an entry? It would leave a hole in the table. This original recipe had a plan for uh, deletion. Down here in the Dell item code, what it does is, if needed, it swaps with the uh, last entry to avoid leaving the hole. But in fact, that sacrifices the order. There's another way to do this. Just leave the hole there, as we currently do. That causes a branch prediction. It costs you a little bit of space. But when it uh, gets up to 2 thirds full, just like everything else in the dictionary, you do a resize and a, uh, a compaction. That said, there's a reason I published this this way. Four years ago, what was the principle? Ordered is better than scrambled, or scrambled is better than ordered? Had I put this in as order, Quido would have just said, no way, we're never doing it which would have been terrible. So to appease the gods, I was like, oh, but when somebody uh, deletes an entry, it changes the order. He's like, oh, scrambled. It's a good thing. <laughs> cool. Then when uh, Anada uh, came along to implement this in uh, C, he went ahead and put the uh, compaction back in, restoring order uh, as they did in uh, a PyPy, which was a very uh, simple modification. And I think ordering is a big, big win. That said, it's not guaranteed until you all decide you like it, until you all defy Quido's will and start come to rely on it. And then if someone ever discusses uh, taking it away from you, you rise up to rebel, and a couple years from now say, of course it's guaranteed. Remember, that's what we did with the uh, Tim sort. And say, uh, there's many things, that behaviors that didn't come guaranteed until uh, later. Uh, question from a lady in the audience. This is a Quido thing. I'm following up on it. Raise your hand and I'll get you a mic. Question from a lady in the audience. Oh. All right. Question from a dude. <laughs> or any other uh, option. What's that? You're welcome. Yes, sir. So, 
Thank you so much. So it is very nice explanation. And my question is that, does this consider to all kind of a big data or and also small data? Because when there is a very small data, sometimes linear problem is okay, then creating a new hash. Is that right? Uh, say the last part again. Yeah, so when there is a very small data set, mm -hmm. like small, real small, at that time, rather creating a new hash, it would be better to do linear probing or something. Be is that true? Because this kind of a scenario is good for all kind of a data set. Is it really small? And what's your name? Pushan. Pushan. Excellent question. 25 bucks. <laughs> Pushan said, when data gets big, it doesn't fit into a uh, cache anymore. Memory accesses are catastrophically slow, but we fetch an entire cache line at a time. Notice how I'm rephrasing your question. And when we fetch a cache line, you get all of the adjacent bytes whenever you're achieving one. So wouldn't it be uh, great if we did a linear probe rather than searching somewhere else? And that's in fact uh, what I talked about at last year's holiday party, what I did for uh, uh, SETS. So SETS actually does a series of linear probes before it jumps to take advantage of the cache uh, aligned performance. On the uh, other hand though, that path is at odds with this. And uh, were we to try and do linear probing, we'd actually have to move the keys adjacent to each other. And that would throw away ordering, throw away all of the space benefits. So uh, you get one or the other, but not both. So if you use sets, you get the uh, uh, linear probing. I've designed sets for extremely fast membership testing, but they won't iterate as fast as uh, dictionaries and they won't be space, as space efficient. On the other hand, that's not their typical use case. But for uh, dictionaries, which dominates all the rest of use of uh, Python. Wow, oh, there was one ambiguous uh, term that you used, big data and small data. Uh, my thoughts on the subject, I heard at a uh, Pi Data conference this notion of medium data. <laughs> and medium data, I think, serves as a great concept to separate big from small. What is medium data? Medium data is small enough to fit on your computer, but big enough to where if you rum use a crummy algorithm, you're going to really pay a price for it. So big data is anything bigger than that. Now, if you go to an actual big data conference, bigness varies. There's the mega bigs, the giga bigs, and the peta bigs. And the peta people think if you're not saying peta, it's not actually uh, big data. So big is kind of a relative concept. I think the concrete concept is medium. Yes, sir. So speaking of cache lines, do you ever have the um, possibility of having a cache line split access, or is it always aligned to the cache line? So the question is, are we aligned with the cache lines? Uh, the compiler makes all of our struct, uh, structure uh, entries 16 byte uh, aligned. Cache line is 64. So the question is, how much do we have in one of those cache lines? And it depends on whether you're using the key sharing uh, dictionary for instances or non-key sharing for uh, non-instances uh, regular dictionary. In key sharing, you have consecutive keys all in a, uh, a row. In a regular dictionary, you have an entry, a key, a value, and a hash. Uh, those are eight bytes each, 16 bytes, or I'm sorry, uh, 24 bytes for the three of them uh, together. And that fits very neatly uh, in the cache line most of the time, but once in a while you get a spill when one of them uh, falls over because 64 is not a multiple of uh, a 24. So once in a while there's a, 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 a spill. Uh, that said, for small dictionaries, if you're hitting them often enough, they're all, all of the parts are already in cache anyway. And making all of Python more cache friendly means that you have more cache available. Uh, the interesting thing about trying to optimize for cache is it's shockingly difficult to time. Because when you go to time it, you're timing the feature of interest, which puts it in cache anyway. So it's hard to observe the effects. Cache uh, effects only show up in big programs that are constantly blowing something else out of uh, hash. So it's shockingly difficult to get good measurements. In fact, one reason I don't trust a lot of people's measurements is they focus on what happens when everything's in cache and they completely ignore the cache effects. Great question, 15 bucks. <laughs> All right. Simeon, do you want to take the, co oh, here we go, Cindy. So one of the most common use cases for a lot of people when they deal with dictionaries is typically JSON data. Mm -hmm. That um, So we're dealing with a lot of nested data structures. So like mm -hmm. you know, a dictionary with a lot of nested dictionaries and extra dictionaries. So I was just wondering how does the cache friendliness of those kind of dictionaries um, sort of hold up? OK. 
Okay. So there's a couple parts uh, uh, to what Cindy uh, uh, proposed. She said, one, when you're dealing with nested data structures, which were very common uh, in JSON uh, uh, data, is there interesting, any interesting cache effect there? And how does that interact with all the dictionaries I've shown here? There's actually no special uh, end interaction, and there's nothing special about nestedness. Internally to Python, Python containers don't contain anything. You put something in a list, it's not really in a list, we just have a reference to the original object. So everything in Python is kind of all nested anyway. If you look at little object diagrams, it's just a big pile of spaghetti. So from Python's point of view, the JSON uh, data is no different than anything else. Also, uh, unless your JSON data is huge and filling up uh, all of your memory, most Python programs, their dictionary usage isn't just the JSON. We think about the dictionaries we name, like, oh, I'm looking at my data has a dictionary. That is the dictionary. But in fact, your modules are dictionaries, your globals are dictionaries, your every attribute lookup is a dictionary. Everyone, every time you use a dot in Python, except for a decimal point, you're doing a dictionary lookup. So in fact, they're everywhere, uh, whether you realize them or not. So a uh, typical Django uh, uh, our run is making millions of uh, dictionaries and not the one that the designer thought about and said, oh, I've got a big dictionary to save everything. So I would say that there's no special effect other than when it comes to cash, smaller is better, always. Excellent question, 25 bucks. Yes, sir. And I see Eddie pointing at somebody, raise your hand, I'll, bring, I'll get you next. So, you made a very good, good point that you can improve speed, you can improve memory utilization, you can improve cache hits, but you've been sort of talking about, well, the average user, this is what's important. Um, is there actually a census that gathers democratic, demographic data about Python and so that you could model for the average user, this trade-off would be better or worse. Uh, I should think that might be useful. So his uh, our question is quite interesting. Sometimes when you're optimizing or improving the language, you're making trade-offs. You make one thing better while you're making something else worse, and hopefully that thing that you're making worse isn't in common use or doesn't take some particular user who relies on it and makes their life catastrophically uh, uh, bad. Dictionaries are kind of a special case, though. Everything in the Python world uses dictionaries. If you improve dictionaries anywhere, you improve all of Python. And so I don't know of any special cases where we have made anyone worse. Making these things smaller and making them uh, faster is pretty much a straight across the board uh, win. The only case is the one that uh, concerns me uh, perfectly, uh, personally is I, uh, I designed the LRU cache. And the LRU cache hits a stable size <clears throat> and once it does, it deletes an entry, adds an entry, deletes an entry, adds an entry. And so we end up with lots of holes and resizes. Uh, the measurements I've done so far, I can't tell whether it's made it better or worse by much or, or, or by a little bit, but I know it hasn't made it better or worse by a lot. So uh, it is roughly in the same ballpark as uh, before. So possibly if your entire life is an LRU cache, you might have gotten a little better or a little worse, I don't know. His other more uh, uh, very interesting question is, how do we know what everybody does? Well, there are some Python core developers who develop basically for themselves. The idea is they have an itch, they came to scratch it, I needed this and I put it, uh, put it in. This sounds terrible and it's selfish, but it's uh, how the open uh, bazaar works. Do you like the JSON module? Bobby Polito wrote it because he needed a JSON module, not because he cares about you. Later, he's like, okay, I care about Rob a little bit. I'll donate it to Python and uh, uh, sign, it, sign it over. A lot of things came into uh, uh, Python that way. So there's the core developers who develop for themselves, and the idea is what's good for us is good for you. I don't universally believe that is uh, true. So particularly when it comes to API design, I, uh, I try out APIs on uh, students in classes. I try them out engineers uh, for my clients. I, uh, I, I make blog posts or I, uh, I post out codes uh, on ASP and recipes so people can try it out and to where I can get the feedback. What I used to use quite a bit to inform the design in Python is Google code search. 
So I could take any tool in Python, and the question would come, how do people use it in the wild? And I could search for Python in that particular tool and see everywhere in the world how it was being used. And so it informed me of what users were actually uh, uh, doing. So Google took that away, and now I have something that is not as good, which is GitHub code search. The GitHub code search is good in the sense of it's a fine search engine. It's bad in that it has sampling errors of now I get to learn what are the needs of people who use GitHub. And they are not representative of the uh, rest of the programmers in the world who might have quite different uh, uh, needs. Military programmers you know, uh, would never use uh, uh, GitHub, uh, for example. So I've immediately got a sampling bias. But how do we learn what's around this? I can search. I can go to conferences and see what people do. I can try out apps. I can see what my needs uh, are. And there are lots of folks who have Python apps that are performance intensive. And every time that we go into beta, they go and run tests. And when they uh, run the test, the people for, uh, occasionally will get a bug report. Somebody from, uh, who maintains Cheetah will come back and say, someone made a change to uh, the regular expression module that was only a little one line change to clean up some code, and it slowed us down 15%. And we'll revert it uh, immediately. So either someone has to scream. I have to search and uh, uh, find them, get lucky, or your needs have to match mine, or, uh, or your needs don't get taken care of at all. It's a somewhat random uh, process. Excellent question. 25 bucks. Just to crowdsource a, a random thing, uh, somebody help me. I, I guess the beer has killed me to brain cells, but uh, I was recently seeing a GitHub project where you, op, uh, you run your Python code. It profiles and then suggests that you recompile Python with GCC flags. So it's like optimizing your Python for your prop particular problem problem set. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Nobody else. So ah, all right. I'm guessing that is a form of PGO, performance guidance optimization. The idea is you compile a Python, and the compiler doesn't know how Python is going to be used. And unlike Linux, we don't fill it with a lot of hints on branch prediction, in part because some of the feedback from the Linux community was that what were accurate predictions at one time stopped being accurate later and they actually worked to the detriment of the compiler. The compilers are just getting really smart at figuring this out. But with PGO, you run your uh, compile your Python, uh, run it on your application, the PGO learns how your application gets used and recompiles it. Which to me is just a slow version of PyPy. PyPy does that for you anyway. Uh, that's why we have just-in-time uh, compilers. But in fact, it is a great way to go, and the Windows distributions in Python, I think Martin Von Lois might still be building them, or it might be uh, Ned Dealey uh, uh, now, and they're always built with uh, PGO. And the problem, uh, the good part of PGO is it makes Python a lot faster. The bad part is it tunes it to a specific application, and that application's hotspots. And so when you tune it, it needs to be you. And then if your needs change, then your underlying Python uh, uh, doesn't change. And so I'm kind of a generalist. I believe GCC just has ESP, and it mostly knows what I want most of the time, rarely guesses uh, are wrong, and I go with that. But uh, this sounds like a fantastic project. Uh, someday they should meet the PyPy people who will do it in just in time uh, manner. Excellent question, seven bucks. <laughs> Marty, an old friend. Very good. Thank you for the talk tonight. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question since you've been promoting 3.6 coming out next week. Um, any gotchas for people going from 3.4 or 3.5 to 3.6 that people should be aware of? His question is, are there any uh, gotchas that you should uh, be aware of moving from 3.4 to 3.5 to uh, 3.6? Hmm. You're putting me in the position of saying something negative about something I love. <laughs> And keep in mind, I'm unique amongst the core developers in that I did not love Python 3 for most of its existence. I don't even love Python 3.5 much at all. I believe that when you were told, go to Python 3 because it's better than Python 2, trust me, for most of the time, that was not true. 3.0 was slower than Python 2.7. Memory hog, email module didn't work. But so few people used it that people didn't realize it. So we could go around and say, the number is three, it's bigger than the number two, therefore you should upgrade. And no one uh, said any different. Now, uh, along the way, the email module got fixed by uh, Python 3.2, and it became usable. That said, I had some friends of mine starting to use it in production, and they're like, am I the first person to ever uh, glue these two parts together? And it's like, yes, you are. And so the people who were happy with it were people teaching classes, people doing toy puzzle problems, writing games. They didn't notice this sort of thing. 
But as you started to use it commercially, it started to uh, fall apart. So I was not a big fan uh, until basically now. Python 3.6 is the first one I love. I've been working every weekend and night for years to make it good, and it is finally uh, uh, worthy. Uh, so any gotchas along the way, which effectively translates to, is there anything I don't like about Python 3.6? To upgrading. I don't know of any. All the code I have written for the Python 3s goes up almost effortlessly. Uh, what is really nice is when a person becomes a new core developer, they tend to be very deprecation happy. Everybody knows, oh, I should clean things up. This thing is old. I'll make a new one that's better and deprecate the old one. I was that way when I became a Python core developer, and I deprecated a few things. And then I heard the screams from the people. <laughs> we have no test for our code and you deprecated it. And he's like, I can't upgrade now. And I realized deprecation uh, caused an enormous amount of pain. But we had a whole bunch of deprecators. And Python, and nobody's using Python 3.3. So by the time Python 3.5 comes around, lots of things have been deprecated out. You had a warning period, but you weren't using Python 3. And so uh, at the uh, last developer summit, I just presented uh, this little model. You have a little fence, you have a, uh, a sack of gold, and you want somebody to climb over the fence to get to the uh, gold. How do you incentivize them? A, make the paw sack of gold bigger. The compact key sharing dick does that. It makes it worth upgrading. Async IO was the compelling reason to move up uh, to Python 3. If you didn't need async, you didn't really need Python uh, uh, 3.5. Now 3.6 is so much better than Python 2.7, you really want it. So the pot of gold is bigger. And everybody's like, oh, then they'll all switch. I go, but along the way, a bunch of you deprecators have been making the fence higher and higher and higher and higher. And so there have been years of effort putting into uh, migrating Twisted. It will happen this year, but it was hard. And along the way, every time they got something running, so there were the deprecators came along, and we, the divergence between two and three grew and grew over time. I think we're now at a point where everybody just needs to switch Forget the greatest Python ever invented, 2.7. Move, uh, uh, move forward. This one is uh, finally worthy of it. Uh, but in fact, I managed to get this across, and we've undeprecated a whole bunch of things. So Python 3.6 broke hypothesis, for example, by deprecating part of the inspect protocol, and we undid that. So I think it ought to be fairly effortless. Excellent question. 30 bucks. Last question. Last question. Yes, sir. Do you have a preview or a teaser for something you're working on or another core dev that you think is cool for 3.7, 3.8, somewhere far out? A preview of what I'm working on. I have an aspiration in about one week. As soon as uh, 3.6 goes out final, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> we have nurtured and babied this release. In fact, if I'm not exhausted when I get all the way back to Santa Clara tonight, I'm going to be editing the What's New document because the What's New document is what you're going to read to tell you what's inside. And so it needs to have good examples rather than just uh, whatever spewed out of, uh, out of the keyboard. And so I'm going to sleep. But when I wake up, uh, probably in collections deck, I will add uh, uh, slicing. Uh, Victor has another handful of optimizations up his sleeve. Yuri, uh, who's worked mostly on async, has some brilliant ideas for speeding up uh, uh, Python uh, itself. Uh, Anata is going wild now, looking at uh, set and dictionary uh, code, looking for some of the cleanups that I uh, uh, mentioned here. Uh, big feature-wise, uh, I'm not thinking of any uh, uh, right now. That said, the floodgates to me, it seems like if open, I believe that we're adding features too fast and we're doing them out without a lot of user feedback. And I, I, I'm concerned that we're adding features that individually seem to make sense, but brought together might be terrible. Here's a, an example. A feature of Python 3.6 is to make it easier for the optional static typers is the colon can be used now when you're doing a variable assignment. x equal 10 can now be x colon int equal uh, uh, 10. Easy enough, and that will make uh, typing a lot more uh, uh, beautiful. So now we can use colons in multiple places. 
Another thing that we uh, got in Python 3.6 is in your uh, uh, numeric literals, you can put underscores where you would normally put uh, uh, commas. The problem is underscores are used for lots of other things. And colons are used for other things. And so now I'm finding that there are, I've been using Python 3.6 for quite some time now. I always work on uh, the head. And find, I'm starting to find this, that occasionally when I make typos, Python used to complain to me because I had done something syntactically invalid. Not, now there are lots of random key presses I made that are, are uh, valid. Underscore O has always been a valid uh, variable name. But O underscore is not a valid variable name and would be an error. And that's an easy transposition error to make. But now it's a valid uh, number. O underscore is a number. Like add a comma uh, inside it. And so I've come up with all these little combinations of keystrokes I've made that say, wow, I can't believe that went through and didn't uh, complain. I'm uh, uh, taking a dictionary, copying it out, and I left the, uh, I grabbed, the, I killed one of the curly braces, and I'm like, you leave a curly brace off uh, the dictionary, it's going to be invalid, right? But that colon is now treated as a, uh, a typing declaration, and it became valid. So I'm worried that the weight of addition of features is now too fast. We, what we used to do is put something in, watch how it plays out, put, uh, propose another one, tease it out a little bit, see how it interacts with anything else. And uh, uh, Python is evolving very fast. Uh, I teach Python for a living. I do Python consulting for a living. And my worry as a consultant is Python is so big now, nobody on the face of the planet except for maybe Yuri and uh, uh, Serhei, knows what's in Python now. I have had Steve Holden, uh, someone uh, propose a feature request. I've had Steve Holden, chairman of the P, uh, former chairman of the PCESF, a Python instructor, come out and say, we really need this feature. And it had been there for a long time. And that happens a lot. Uh, lots of core developers have never gotten into async I.O. yet. We don't know how it all works yet and surely haven't played out all the consequences. Do you go the Beasley uh, route, Curio, or do you go the async IO route? The implications of this are not known. As a consultant, people are about to ask me really hard questions I don't know the answer to. As a teacher, I have to ask myself, can I still teach Python in a week? I don't think so. It is now a very, very, very big language. So there's some concerns there. That said, it seems to be working out fine for people. IEEE ranked it in the uh, top three languages in the world. It's the number one language taught in universities in the world, number one in high schools, uh, and uh, for the second half of elementary school, also number one. It dominates many, many uh, communities. Uh, so whatever we've done to it apparently hasn't killed it. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Excellent question. 26 bucks. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you again for the honor of inviting me to your party. <laughs>